like as as web designers, we get, we're, we're doing a lot more animation these days, which I think is super great, 100% behind that. Uh, but I've noticed we use a lot of different kinds of easing, but we don't really know what's happening behind the scenes of that easing. Like we might use some Penner equations, some cubic beziers, some springs, all this stuff in one project, but we often don't actually know what's going on behind all of that. I know I didn't for a while, um, but then I decided to really geek out over easing and figure out what's happening behind the scenes kind of frame by frame when we pick these different easing options. You know, things like when you want to know what the difference is between a quad ease in out or a quint ease in out, or like why is it so hard to make springs not look like crap in CSS? All those kinds of questions. Um, so who's ready to geek out with about some easing? Fun? Okay, good. I was really worried you were going to say no, and then I'd be like, well, <laughs> too bad. So let's get something moving, like something super basic to start with. Uh, for example, Space Cat. I like Space Cat. He's pretty cool. Uh, if we wanted to make Space Cat, say, move across the screen approximately 500 pixels, um, you know, we need to do a few things to do that frame by frame. So let's take a look at what it would take to make him move across the screen, kind of like the hard way or like by hand, uh, by hand in code anyways. So there's a couple things we would know for sure. We know that we want uh, Space Cat to take three seconds to go across the screen. So we have our total time of three seconds. Um, we know, or at least I'm going to assume at this point in time, that we are running at 60 frames per second, which means if we want to find the total number of frames to take, that is three times 60. And we also know that we're going to have Space Cat go from where he is to 500 pixels to the right, which will be starting at zero, going to 500, which makes uh, Space Cat's change in position 500. So we're going to move 500 pixels over three seconds seconds is basically what we've got there. So once we have all of those things set and kind of worked out, we can get to actually making Space Cat move. So the best way to do that, obviously, would be to call some kind of function every frame, perhaps with like request animation frame, which is what's happening here, or any way that you have access to frame per frame stuff. So on each frame, we probably first want to check if we should still be animating, which is what that first line is there, just like, hey, is the current frame less than the total number of frames that we should go? Because if not, we should stop. If it is, we should go. OK, cool. And then we can take, uh, you know, kind of calculate the progress of how far into that three seconds that we are. And we can do that by picking um, which frame we currently are and dividing it by the total number of frames. So that's going to give us a number between 0 and 1 of like how far percentage-wise, we are through our, our three-second animation. Uh, once we hit three, we get one, and then we're done. So once we have that, we can take that percentage of how far through time we are and apply it to how far in distance we need to go. So we can make our current value, of, like where we need to be on this particular frame, the total change in value, which was 500, multiplied by the percentage of how far we are in time. And then if we run that, this is going to be so amazing. Space Cat animates from left to right, <laughs> going 500 pixels and taking uh, three seconds. Or, well, actually, 500 SVG pixels, but that's a whole other story. So what we just created there, frame by frame, by you know, taking the percentage of time and applying it to the percentage of our total movement, was essentially some linear easing. We had a direct relationship between how long it took and where we went. So if we were to make a fun graph like this, a fun motion graph, and plot like the uh, time that passed with the amount that our x value um, changed, we would get a straight line relationship, because when we're 50% of the way through um, our time, we're also 50% of the way through our actual movement. Kind of cool, sort of a boring graph, right? And like the movement of Space Cat was not very realistic. And I do understand that a cat in a space suit is unrealistic to begin with. But <laughs> that aside, if Space Cat was in space, that movement wouldn't be correct, because with no atmosphere, Space Cat would never stop. It would just go forever. <laughs> Bye, Space Cat. Um, and if, <laughs> if Space Cat was here on Earth with us, there's no way he could just go one speed, right? He would need to speed up into his movement, otherwise it just would never work. So let's try to make this a tiny bit more realistic. One way we could do that, like this is what we had so far, we're basically like our current value at this frame is equal to the percentage of how far we in on t are in on time um, and that percentage of how far we're going, just that straight linear thing. But what if we took progress and through every frame we started out making it small and then let our, our, our change in our x value, like that change, the thing we're animating, get bigger over time? One way we could do that, I mean, there's a lot of ways we could do that, but perhaps the easiest way we could do that would be to multiply progress by itself. Because progress is going to be a number that is between 0 and 1. And if you multiply a number less than 1 by itself, it gets smaller. 
Uh, but then the nice thing is, is because we're still going along with our time, eventually that will still hit one, because you'll get a bigger and bigger number the further along in time that you go, and that therefore your progress time progress will get bigger and bigger as well, just not in a linear fashion. So if we take a look at how Space Cat moves with this one, we can play that. Anytime, Space Cat. Yeah. So instead of being a constant speed, Space Cat kind of speeds up into his launch, I suppose. I'm not really sure where he's going. So we've got a nice little bit of uh, some actual easing there, because some people would argue that linear easing isn't easing at all because the speed never changes, but that's an argument for another time. So with this new equation, we have what would be called an easing quad. Essentially, as we are um, going forward in time, our, our x value is increasing, because we're also going along um, from left to right, but it starts out increasing at a lower rate, right? Like at the very beginning, since we're multiplying progress by itself, it just starts out really slow, and then it speeds up and still reaches the top. So you have a nice easing, and if we want to get like super crazy, prepare yourself for this one, we can multiply progress by itself again. To get it even more severe, right? When we're squaring it, it starts out a little bit slow. When we cube it like this, it starts out even slower, and the change in speed is even more drastic. So we could keep going with this. We could multiply it by itself four times, five times, as many times as you want. Or we could just admit that we have started making uh, the Penner easing equations the hard way. Um, has anyone here heard of the Penner easing equations? Yeah, a couple people, usually all old flash people, my people. Um, <laughs> the Penner easing equations were initially started by Robert Penner, who was a flash developer, who was frustrated with how difficult it was to reuse animations on the flash timeline. If you made yourself a nice little tween on the timeline, had the perfect easing that you wanted, you would basically have to recreate it again to use it again, and that sucks. So he created the Penner easing equations, which was a way in code to have animations that would be reusable. These are all of them. Memorize them quickly. <laughs> no, just kidding. If you've ever chosen an easing in some like JavaScript library or CSS library with any of these names, you have used the Penner easing equations. The nice thing that you'll notice about the patterns here is that they're always in groups of three. There's an ease in, there's an ease in out, and, and, and an ease out. So, like we saw with ease in quad, we have the ease in that would look like that. The ease out quad would basically be that uh, curve inverse, kind of just like multiplying by negative one. And then for ease in out quad, the time essentially gets broken into two. And for the first half of the duration, the first half of the time, um, he normalizes a version of ease in. And then for the second half of the time, he changes the way um, that relationship is calculated and does an ease out instead. And that happens for all of every single one of the ease in, whether it's quad, quint, cubic, or all of those things. And if you prefer to seek it in math instead of graphs, that's what it looks like. So you can see when we were doing the, uh, the, the ease in quad for space cat, we were using really long-winded variables. In the actual equations, they use like single letters, but that's really hard to type and read at the same time. And the Penner easing equations show up in a lot of places. For example, uh, one that you might have used or that gets used most commonly right now is the Green Sock easing library, where um, a good portion of their easing is actually based on the Penner easing equations. For example, power one is actually quad. That's like, that's quad ease in. Power two is cube. Power three is, uh, is quart, and then power five is quint, or power four, rather, is quint. I always mix those up. There's also a few slightly more complex ones, because there's other ways to calculate relationships between two numbers, like circle, expo, um, and, and ones like that. So it's a whole bunch of different ways, whole vari variations on ways to ease in and ease out and create these animations that are reusable and, um, and have like, a, a meaningful relationship to each other. There's also more complex Penner easing equations that you might have seen, like elastic or even, you know, bounce, which gets a lot more complicated. And these work in a very similar way to the ease and out, but instead of only separating time in one place, it's uh, segmented multiple times, and the, the equation used to calculate the change in value is changed based on those segments, too. So the Penner easing equations are super awesome. Um, this is uh, Robert Penner's page about his equations. I would highly recommend reading his chapter on easing, even though it's about flash. It's a pretty cool story, at least if you're um, as much into geeking out about math and easing as I am. Uh, and you'll notice on the bottom there that the e Penner easing equations have been translated to just about every programming language you've ever heard of or that currently gets used today. The interesting thing is, is that third line down, the one about CSS, SCSS, and less, CSS, because of the way easing works in CSS, those are only approximations of the Penner easing e equations. So what it, basically what happened is someone like Matthew Lean went in and approximated the Penner easing equations to cubic Bezier functions. 
because the way you draw cubic Bezier's is not the same we draw the penner easing equations exactly. So they can only be approximated. Um, and that's also why we don't have the full list of Penner equations in CSS. You'll notice that like the balance and elastic aren't in there because those just aren't possible with cubic Bezier's. We'll look at that in a second. Penner easing equations can also be found more visually on easings.net. If you want to see like a little thumbnail of how they work and look at all the curves, it's pretty great. Um, but like I said, the Penner easing equations for CSS have all been approximated uh, for cubic Bezier's. The main reason being for how you draw cubic Bezier's. So cu cubic Bezier's work in much the same way as like drawing with a pen tool, an illustrator, a sketch, or whatever else you might be drawing with. It basically creates a line between two points based on the position of two control handles. So you sort of have like point 0.0, point 0.1, point 0.2, and point 0.3. Um, and then based on the angle and the, where, how far out those handles are drawn, we influence the line that's drawn between those two uh, circles. There's a super long explanation for it, but I'm going to give you the short explanation for it. Essentially, cubic Bezier's are actually drawn over time. Time for a computer, not time for us. So like we never really see it being drawn, but time is a factor in the equations that make cubic Bezier's happen. We essentially kind of trace these handles and the connecting line between them, follow those along, as well as a tangent line um, connecting those two, and then that little dot in the middle is like you're dragging an imaginary pencil to draw the curve. And that's how it happens. There's a really great video that I've linked there if you want to see this in more detail, because I think it's pretty great. But essentially, those handles influence the curve, and depending on how you move them, that's the different shape of the curve. So you can see when you look at like, drawing cubic bezies like that, why easing like this is not possible with one cubic bezier, right? If you've ever tried to like, create bounces in CSS and you're like, oh, why is it just not working? It's because cubic beziers can't really do this. Um, you know, you'd need some multiple beziers, multiple cubic beziers probably like stacked on top of each other, or one after the other to do it. You could probably pull it off, but honestly, it would be a lot of work and you'd probably just be better, you know, using this easing equation or using this penner easing equation. The really great thing about cubic Bezier's, though, is the fact that we can visually manipulate them to be basically whatever we want. Um, this is cubicbezier.com, made by Leah Veroux, who you may know because she was just on stage like a half hour ago. Um, so if you don't, awkward. <laughs> um, and this is a really great tool where you can you know, actually visually move those handles, see how the curve is influenced, and then you can even test out the, cur uh, test out the um, easing as well. And the really easy way to read these curves is where they're steeper, they're going faster, the rate of change is faster. And where they're um, more flat, it's going slower. So you can really visually tell, like this one's going to start fast and then kind of really slow down. Um, and it's, they're easy to read visually, and we can get almost any amount of easing we want out of these cubic beziers. Even better, browsers have started giving us better tools for cubic beziers. Anywhere we use them in CSS, we can pull up a little editor in Chrome or Firefox. We can even edit it and then see the changes live when we go run our animation again, as long as we don't have to refresh the page. Pretty cool. It's like, oh, yeah, there's a nice bounce to them. No, that looks terrible. Try again, self. Uh, we also have um, the timeline and dev tools for animations in both Firefox and Chrome. This is the Chrome one. We can scrub back and forth. We can see where all um, those various transitions are, and we can even see what Cubic Bezier they're, they're using, what their um, easing looks like. So there's tons we can do with, with Cubic Bezier's. They just are coming from a slightly different place than the Penner easing equations. So the Penner easing equations and uh, cubic Bezier's have, they have a lot in common. You know, they're really good for predefined UI animations, things that you know what's going to happen. If you're like, that menu's going to come from off screen to on screen, good place for both of these kinds of things. They're really great for animations that demonstrate and for making any kind of animations behave similarly. Like if you decided to go with all the easing and quint uh, equations, all of your animations would have a really similar feel, which is nice. So that's really good. So basically, they're reusable, they're customizable, you can make any cubic bezier you want. If you don't like the functions that Robert Penner came up with, you can just like mess with them yourself because they're open source. You can totally go have at that. But the sort of sad part is they both need a defined duration and a defined destination before the animation starts. For CSS, you have to actually put that in your CSS, right? I put it and say, like, we're going here, take this long. Um, and for the Penner easing equations, it's JavaScript, you still have to know by the time the animation actually starts happening, like before it fires, you have to tell it how long to take and where to go. Um, you could do that right before the animation fires, but it still needs that information to work. Sometimes it's not really possible, though. You know, if you think about any sort of interaction that requires, like, continual input, things like scrolling, where maybe you don't know how far they're going to scroll, but you would still like to ease that, you know, you can't set a destination, a set destination. You can't say every scroll is going to take five seconds, because if you're scrolling really far, that's going to be weird. If you're scrolling, like, a very short distance, it'll be like, eh, 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 eh. it will also totally suck. 
So sometimes we can't know our destination or how long it should take ahead of time. And that's where we can go and look at some easing that game developers use. Um, for example, LERP, which is like the best word ever. It just it actually kind of sounds like you're throwing up. You're like, oh, LERP. Um, <laughs> but it's great. I didn't actually realize it had a name until really recently. I read a, a post by um, uh, Rachel Smith, and I was like, it has a name. It has the best name. I will LERP all the things. <laughs> The best thing about LERPing, uh, it actually stands for, it's a weird compactification, I don't even know what you call it, of linear interpolation, so LERP. Um, you don't have to set a duration, doesn't need to know how long it's gonna take. Um, you calculate how far it needs to go uh, one frame at a time, so its destination can change, and you just basically move a fraction closer to the place you're going with each frame. To take a look at how that would look, um, we can do it with, uh, with something really simple like this. If we wanted to just kind of like actually lerp the x value like we did um, with our space cat, we can go and say, hey, let's take the difference of where we're going, where we're headed to, the difference between where we're going and where we are, and then let's take that difference and multiply it by a small number less than one. So instead of moving the whole distance over that frame, we'll move just like a tenth of it, um, and then you actually set your position to that new difference, that reduced difference, and you keep doing that every frame. So you get closer and closer to, to your destination. And technically, yes, if you're always like dividing it by a small number, you won't technically reach your destination, um, but thanks to rounding, we'll get to zero eventually. And if we wanna look at how that looks frame by frame, we can run this one. And this is just a snapshot of each frame as it like lerps towards its destination. One thing that's a little weird about lerping is the idea that like, hey, you know, um, we just said this is linear interpolation, but that clearly changes speed while it's moving. So the linear in this case is not the same like idea of like linear easing where it's a linear relationship between the values. It's the fact that the point you're at and the point you're going to are on the same line. They can be connected by a line. So it's linear in that sense. It's like the super mathy linear, not the visual linear. I don't know. If you ever end up at like an animation pub quiz night, that will help you out. Uh, like everything, it's more fun if you do it on both the X and Y axis, so we can just do it twice here, and then make it actually happen on click instead of just when we drag the mouse around, because that will be more fun. And we're like, yay! Well, in a second we will be. It just keeps going, both on the X and Y axis, and then you can be fancy and give it a little bit of a trail. You can make one heck of a mouse chaser. Please don't use it for mouse chasers. <laughs> it's just the easiest way to demonstrate it. One other kind of easing that does not require a set destination or a set time for it to take is springs. Um, and springs are a little mysterious. We can't do them in CSS now, though um, the nightly build of Safari has started doing them recently, so I think they might be coming soon. And usually when you get to go make a spring, you're just like, hey, here's three numbers. Spring stuff? Uh, if you're more of a visual person, you can imagine that the thing you are moving is this orange box, and it is attached by a spring to some kind of surface. Um, you'll notice like when you pull it, it starts kind of bouncing, but like less and less and slower and slower until it gets back to its sort of like resting place, because um, it always wants to be in that nice balanced amount of forces. Um, if you're more into like math equations, you can look at it as Hooke's Law, which it technically is, but basically, and I'm sorry for any physicists in the room, but essentially this equation just says there's some forces going that way and there's some forces going this way. Uh, <laughs> but it is, so it's like the spring constant, a, a property of the spring of how like rigid it might be and some aspect of how far it's being pulled. Um, we, we see this in things like Framer, where there's like these three things we can pick to, to uh, adjust our spring. Um, there's the tension and the friction, which are kind of properties of the spring itself. Like maybe it's a very tense, tightly coiled spring. Maybe there's a lot of friction because it's very heavy. And the velocity is kind of a function of the, um, the thing itself. So if we adjust those, we get different springs, and sometimes you know, we can get some different spring behavior. But we don't actually have to use a fancy library to get springs if we don't want to. We can totally do it ourselves with some multiplication. Um, I'm gonna go through this kind of quick, so if you wanna see it again later, you can totally find me later. But essentially what we can do is assume that, um, you know, the, the amount we want something to move, like it's really similar to lerping. We take a look at how far we need to go, and we consider that a force. And then we reduce it a little bit because we decide like how strong is our spring. If we're pulling it by like clicking somewhere else, that spring is gonna resist that force. So we use some amount of strength to reduce that force down because the spring will be resisting it. See, force in two directions. Yeah, I'm so good at physics. Um, and another thing that's gonna exist is some kind of drag or friction. Like some aspect of the spring or the environment that it's in will also be like acting in the opposite direction of that pulled spring. So we'll add a little bit of drag or we'll take away a little bit of drag by multiplying our velocity um, by some number less than one, so it reduces it just a little bit. And then we will add the force, 
pulled force to the velocity that we might already be moving. It could be zero if we're coming from a standstill. Um, and then we'll change that new velocity, assign that to be our position. Depending on, you know, this one is kind of springy. If we increase our drag, it's gonna get our, um, it's gonna be taking less away from the force, so it'll get even floppier. If we increase the strength of our spring, it's gonna get more rigid and more like pointed and staccato-y. Um, so these two values, we can kind of fake springs by faking those two, by those two numbers. And both of them have to be very small numbers since we're taking them away from the velocity or the force, but they can reduce things while the velocity and the force are pushing things as well. Um, so it's a fun way to kind of fake springs. It's even more fun, of course, when you do it in two, uh, two directions, both x and y. If you want to get really fancy, you can do it with vectors, so you can make the x and y coordinates come up with them at the same time. Vectors are the best for that. They're good for drawing, they're good for mathing, they're amazing. Um, and then we can have this ball going in all directions with that little bit of spring. Just by calculating those forces in the same way, but using a vector instead. So it's a pretty fun way to get stuff done. There's lots of things like going with scrolling or height, or even scaling of elements that have to be directly related to input that you can use this for. Um, or you can just make a bunch of really fun code pens like this to play around with. So I hope all of this will come in handy the next time you go to do some animating, whatever it might be, um, or if you're ever wondering like why it is that I can't do springs in CSS. It's because when you set a duration, springs just aren't so great. Um, I'm gonna be here all night, so if you, I mean, I'm happy to talk to any of you more about web animation stuff if you want to. And uh, with that, thanks so much for listening. <laughs>